We've started kind of a tradition, and uh, this is uh, our workshop in philosophy, politics, and economics that meets um, every uh, week on Thursdays from 2 to 3.30, usually in, in room 318 in Enterprise Hall. Um, you can go online and, and uh, you know, see the schedule for the semester. But we are sort of getting in the habit of doing uh, book talks uh, to start the semester and to end the semester. Um, and so this year we'll have, at the end of the semester, Todd Zawicki um, has a new book out on the history of uh, consumer credit in the United States um, that has just come out and, and that. And so, and today, of course, we're here to um, discuss Pete Leeson's uh, most recent book, Anarchy Unbound. Uh, my name is Pete Betke. For those of you who don't know me, I I'm the, uh, run the uh, uh, sort of F.A. Hayek program for advanced study in philosophy, politics, and economics um, in the economics department here at George Mason University. And uh, so let's get started. So the way the format will go here is we'll have Pete uh, talk uh, a summary about the book, and then we'll have uh, comments from our distinguished visitors, and then Pete will respond, then we'll open it up. Uh, for Q&A. So let me introduce uh, the different uh, people. We have on my far right is John Hasness. Uh, John is a professor um, in the School of Business, uh, the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University, where he also uh, is the executive director of the Georgetown Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics. Um, uh, John is well known to many of us here at George Mason that work in the area of law and economics, in particular, uh, uh, an essay now, which he wrote many, many years ago, a law review article called The Myth of the Rule of Law. It's a very uh, strong challenge to a lot of uh, central presuppositions in legal theory. Um, next to him is Barack Richman, who is the Edgar and Elizabeth Bartlett Professor of Law and Business Administration at Duke University. He's also uh, the author of the forthcoming book with Harvard called Stateless Commerce. Um, Barack works in the overlap of uh, institutional economics, uh, business economics organization, and political economy. So uh, Barack is a perfect commenter, uh, as well as John on, on this book today. And then finally, we have Pete Leeson. Pete is the newly in const or whatever, I don't know what the right word is, so it's, that's a wrong word, but the Duncan Back Professor of Economics and the Law here at George Mason University where he holds appointments both in the econ department and the law school. He's the edit, North American editor of Public Choice, the author of The Invisible Hook, and numerous other articles, and most notably today, Anarchy Unbound, Why Self-Governance Works Better Than You Think. So please welcome Pete Leeson. Before we get going here, um, I want to quickly, and impo but importantly, thank the Mercatus Center for putting together this event and, and holding it for my panel. I appreciate all the work that those of you who have worked on this uh, put into it. Um, also, of course, I'd like to thank our distinguished visitors for, for coming out. I greatly appreciate it. I've looked up to both of them and admired their work for a long time, so it's a very special thing for me to actually have them here to comment on my work on related themes. And finally, but critically, I want to thank Pete and Timur Karan, who's not here today, uh, but who is the co-editor on the series at Cambridge that published my book. Um, in particular, Pete, though, because he has for a long time encouraged me to sort of put together my thoughts on, uh, on self-governance and ultimately um, was kind enough to, to put those thoughts into print. So without, without him, there would be no book, so thank you. Having said that, what I want to do is spend, I always say, maybe 20 minutes or so. If I start going, if I go, once we hit 30, someone wave at me or shout anarchy at me or do something. Um, I don't want to go too long, but I want to kind of, at the same time, give you a, a broad sense of, of what the book is about and the, the sorts of, the two sorts of underlying arguments that are closely connected um, that undergird it in my mind. Fundamentally, what the book is about is challenging what I call the conventional academic wisdom with respect to anarchy, or more specifically with respect to the effectiveness of self-governance. According to the conventional academic wisdom, at least as I construe it, uh, self-governance functions under the following social circumstances. When societies are small and the members of their populations are homogenous, they share the same language, they share similar thoughts, for example, about what constitutes fraudulent behavior versus honest behavior, 
as well as how to respond to that. When those two conditions are satisfied, for example, it's easy for members of the population to share the histories of the members of other, other members of the population in terms of their commercial activity, their honesty, their dishonesty, and so on. Interaction between the members of this small and socially homogenous society need to be infinitely repeated, or what is the same, terminate with some constant known probability. The possibility of, of infinitely repeated interaction gives rise to the ability of individuals who are in this, who are in such a society to, for example, condition their willingness to exchange or to cooperate with someone on that person's history, on the way that they've cooperated or not cooperated in the past. If you only have one-off interaction, then you can't, for example, as a way of trying to incentivize cooperative behavior, refuse to interact with someone in the future. But if interaction is repeated many times over, then in fact that possibility is a way you can condition behavior. Self-governance also works, or works in additionally, another requirement that must be satisfied according to the conventional wisdom, is that violent capacity must be evenly distributed throughout the members of the of this small homogenous society where interactions are repeated very frequently. Or at least, either, either we need to think about people not having any sort of violent capacity at all, by which I mean the ability to physically coerce others, or we need to think about people being roughly equally strong if you want to think about, think about it that way. When this condition is satisfied, it means, for example, that one strong guy, more physically powered than the other members of the population, can't simply bowl them over and take their stuff. The other requirement that needs to be satisfied according to the conventional academic wisdom for self-governance to function is that individuals' discount rates need to be low, or what I've alternatively up here phrased as bad apples need to be rare. People who are, people who discount the future very, very heavily. This is important because thinking back to that infinitely repeated or that repeated action requirement that I pointed to a moment ago, if people are relatively patient, then that means, for instance, if they are terminated from future exchanges with another person, if other people find out that they've cheated in the past, then that the present discounted value of that future stream of uh, of that future stream of interactions, if it's not discounted too heavily, will in fact potentially, at least, if the discount rate is sufficiently uh, is is uh, excuse me sufficiently low, will ensure that in fact cooperative behavior occurs. So you need to have small societies, whose mem the populations of which are socially close, who are interacting frequently, who have roughly equal physical capacities, um, and who are relatively patient. When all of those situations are satisfied, according to the conventional wisdom, what's called the discipline of continuous dealings, which I've already uh, referred to implicitly here a couple of times, is able to support cooperation. The discipline of continuous dealings is simply the idea that People adopt a strategy in a society whereby they say, if you cheat me once, I won't interact with you again cooperatively in the future. That discipline of being cut off from the present discounted value of future interactions can, again, if all of these conditions are satisfied, induce cooperation even when government is absent. I call this the easy case for anarchy. And I call it the easy case for anarchy because these are not terribly difficult social conditions um, the, the social problem situation, if you will, that individuals in this circumstance confront is a relatively easy one, which makes self-governance highly effective. It makes it easy for self-governance for anarchy to work. Of course, it also makes it easy for any form of government to work. When people don't have the ability to physically bully other people, and they're all really patient, and they interact a lot, and there's only five of them, and they're all the same, pretty much anything you do will support cooperation. So while the conventional academic wisdom supports the functionality or admits the workability, if you will, of self-governance when these social circumstances are satisfied, that isn't saying a whole hell of a lot. In particular, moreover, as it probably occurred to you, because we have relatively rare cases in which all of these conditions are satisfied. The thinking is that, again, according to the conventional wisdom, is that when you deviate from any one of those conditions, you're deviating from what I'm going to call ideal conditions for that easy case to work, that the discipline of continuous dealings I just told you about, that mechanism of self-governance breaks down. And because it breaks down, anarchy breaks down. It's unlikely to work. That's the 
ultimately the sort of uh, type of argument that my book is, is after. And what I want to do, a way to think about what I want to do in the book, is to raise the bar with respect to the difficulty of the social conditions under which anarchy might be said to work. And that involves doing two things principally. The first of them involves what I call examining hard case anarchy, which asks the question, is it possible perhaps, contrary to the conventional wisdom, that even if we deviate from some of these conditions that I pointed to a moment ago, under which self-governance works under easy case anarchy, that although it's true, the conventional wisdom is correct, that the discipline of continuous dealings breaks down, is it possible that self-governance could be effective nonetheless? My argument ultimately is that yes, in fact, this is entirely possible. Not only is it possible, it's something that we actually observe in the world, past and present. The key theoretical insight that, if you, if you could call it that, it's so simple, that underlies my argument is the idea that people respond to incentives. The conventional wisdom, as I said a moment ago, is correct that the discipline of continuous dealings breaks down when you get to hard case anarchy, when you deviate from those conditions. But it stop, that stops the, the, story short, the, the, the story short, so to speak. There are two things that are important to recognize here. The first is that the discipline of continuous dealings is far from the only mechanism of self-governance that exists. The second thing to recognize is that when you deviate from the easy case conditions, the conditions required for the discipline of continuous dealings to function, what happens is that the cost of failing to provide a self-governing solution for, for the members of any given society that confronts this situation rise, which is to say that the payoff of solving that problem rises, which is to say that people's incentive to find self-governing solutions to their problem when the social circumstances they confront are more difficult than those they confront in the easy case, are stronger. To take one simple example, imagine for instance that instead of people either not having violent capacity at all, or that violent capacity being equally distributed among the members of society, suppose that there was only a small handful of guys who were really, really strong, and everybody else was extremely weak, and there is no government. The failure of the members of, the, of such a society to solve that problem is going to be much larger, precisely because we expect the strong guys to expropriate all the weak guys, than the failure to solve the self-governance problem that exists when that violent capacity asymmetry isn't there, because people can't bully one another. Or to take another example, suppose that have, instead of having a small society that consists of five people, suppose you've got a society that consists of five million people, another deviation from easy case conditions. The gains from trade, at least the potential gains from trade, when society has five million individuals versus when it has five, are inordinately larger. Which is to say that the payoff, if you lack government, of figuring out some self-governing solution to facilitate cooperation are much larger in the harder case, which has a larger society, than in the, weak, than in the easy case, where there's a smaller society. This can be accomplished for any number of the conditions. The basic point is that the harder the case for anarchy, the larger the payoff of solving the problem, which means that we should expect other things equal anyway, for people to be more likely to find innovative solutions, self-governing solutions, to the problems that they confront under hard case anarchy than they do under easy case anarchy. Finally, what I'm going to spend most of my time talking to you about is this hardest case anarchy. This is the second thing that, that my book attempts to accomplish as a means of raising the bar with respect to the difficulty of the argument for self-governance. And that deals with asking the question is of can self-governance, is it possible even if anarchy is able to function contrary to the conventional wisdom in these hard case scenarios, can it ever outperform state-provided governance? My answer there is also yes, and the guiding theoretical insight is again extraordinarily simple. Scarcity doesn't get any more basic than that for an economist. All choice is constrained. How that delivers cases in the real world of anarchy outperforming governments is something I'm going to spend a little bit more time on in a moment. Before doing that, I want to say a little bit more about the hard case, hard case anarchy. I mentioned a moment ago that when you deviate from the conditions required for the discipline of continuous dealings, easy case anarchy, 
that the payoff of finding innovative self-governing solutions for the members of the societies that confront those problem situations rise, which means that other things equal, we should expect them to be more likely to find solutions. The conventional wisdom, the problem for it here, is that it is stuck in this mindset of focusing almost exclusively on the discipline of continuous dealings as a mechanism of self-governance. You can never get to the point I just raised a moment ago about incentives being stronger in hard case anarchy if you can't get past the fact that anarchy definitely can't work in hard case scenarios because we know that the discipline of continuous dealings can't work. We have to somehow, in other words, go beyond the discipline of continuous dealings. And if you look to the world where self-governance is practiced, you find in various hard case scenarios where we deviate from the conditions that I showed you on the first slide, a host of mechanisms that either supplement or substitute for the discipline of continuous dealings as a way of supporting cooperation and facilitating trade in the absence of government. These include signaling mechanisms, which are typically used as a way of supporting, supplementing rather, uh, the discipline of continuous dealings. The simple act of the way that we time trade, the possibility of formal private legal institutions institutions. And what I mean by formal private legal institutions are things like private courts, private police, private mechanisms for enforcement. Not simple custom and unwritten rule, but perhaps written rule, an actual magistrate, but simply a private variety. Superstition is another example of a mechanism of self-governance that's often overlooked. I'll give you one very, very trivial, but also very important, it turns out empirically, uh, example. Suppose that we live in a society without government, uh, but in that society, people hold the following objectively false belief, or scientifically false belief. If you cheat anyone in your interactions, then in, your, in the afterlife, God will punish you. Not, not that hard to think about that, at least in a Christian society. What does that scientifically false belief do? It encourages a self-governing solution, even when, for example, notice that Raise your hand if you understand how that will incentivize good behavior. Now think for a moment if in any way the reason why you think that depends on, if it, if it hinges on the size of the society, the homogeneity of the society, the capacity for physical violence, what was the other one? or the likelihood of people repeatedly interacting. It doesn't. What it does hinge on is a discount rate. If you discount future punishment heavily, then the prospect of rewards or punishments in the afterlife may not be enough to incentivize you to cooperate now. But that's a simple example of a very trivial self-governing mechanism, and yet one that's very common, that deals with a whole host of hard case anarchy problem scenarios. The others I've mentioned here, which I don't have time to go into, but I do discuss in the book, do this as well. What I briefly want to say is, is to mention to be frank, is that each one of the cases, what the book does in each chapter, is basically considers a deviation from each one of the conditions turn by turn, and then shows theoretically a mechanism outside the discipline of continuous dealings that helps to solve that problem, and then empirically uses a case to illustrate its operation in the world. That method of going one at a time doesn't do the following. Relax all of the easy case conditions at once. What if people, what if society is large, everybody is socially different, people are extremely impatient, violent capacity is asymmetrical, and people are unlikely to interact with each other repeatedly? That's a real challenge for self-governance. It's also a real challenge for any form of governance. Nothing works well in that scenario, which is one of the reasons why the book doesn't consider it. It's more of a comparative exercise. Okay. Now what I want to say a little bit more about the book's analysis of hardest case anarchy. Is it theoretically possible that no government could be superior to government? According to the conventional academic wisdom, the modal academic you talk to about these things will tell you no. Any government is better than no government at all. A bit of simple thinking immediately shows, at least to an economist, that this is false. When is no government superior to government? When the cost of government exceeds the benefit of government. When is the cost of government likely to exceed the benefit of government? There's a couple of different sort of archetypal situations in which we might expect that. The benefit of government is likely to be low 
If, for example, imagine that we have a really small society where everybody is socially close, discount rates are low, da 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 da, we satisfy all the conditions for easy case anarchy. In that world, according to the conventional wisdom, even, the logic of the discipline of continuous dealing supports cooperation. All the trade that can be realized is being captured through that simple self governing mechanism alone. Adding government to the picture might improve things a little bit. But in that social circumstance, it's likely to improve it only a little bit. If the cost of adding government is even moderately large, anarchy will remain efficient in that social circumstance. This, by the way, is a large part of the reason why I think we tend to observe anarchy in the real world in what I'll call simple societies, or preliterate, or primitive societies. Societies where there's a few people, they interact repeatedly, they're socially close, they're patient, and violent capacity is evenly distributed. The cost of benefit exceed the cost of government exceeds the benefit of government because the benefit of government is very small. The more important ca in case empirically in which the cost of government is likely to trump the benefit of government, and thus anarchy is going to be efficient. No government is going to outperform government. Is when introducing a government is extremely costly. One obvious case of this that we find in the world is at the global level. The benefits of introducing a global state, at least if you believe that there are lots of gains being left on the table as a result of decentralization in many countries existing, which a lot of economists do. The benefit of introducing a, a, a global state in terms of facilitating additional cooperation are large, potential benefits. But the cost, just the simple administrative costs, of creating and overseeing a global government are enormous very likely even more enormous than the potential benefits of introducing a global government, which is why we continue to exist in global anarchy. There's a more important case, however, when the cost of government exceeds the benefit of government because the cost of government is likely to be very, very high. And that is when the government that we're talking about introducing is not a faithful executor of the public's will or a social welfare maximizing state, but rather an ultra predatory state. A state that consists of political rulers who are self-interested and are very much unconstrained in terms of their governing abilities. The classic case of this, contemporary case, is Somalia, which I want to talk about a little bit. But before I dig deeper into the case of Somalia, where I'm going to argue that we have an example in the real world of no government outperforming government, hardest case anarchy in I want to discuss some of the common pitfalls of attempts to analyze Somalia and to apply this reasoning to other least developed countries. Here's a table. Sorry, it doesn't look too great. I did it very quickly. Uh, but what we have here in the right column is under, in stateless Somalia, so the government of Somalia collapsed in 1991. Everyone agrees at the period from 2000 to 2005. There's some disagreement about whether or not at the moment Somalia has a government. Everybody agrees that in the period from 2000 to 2005, Somalia did not have an effective government. It was anarchic. And, what I've, and over here in the left column, you've got the United States over the same period. And what these are are, I think, 18 welfare indicators for which data are available, most of which, although not all of which, allow a comparison between the United States and Somalia. I simply, sim simply stopped collecting for the US at some point because I got lazy and the pattern is obvious. Per capita GDP in the US, 44,000. Somalia, $600. Life expectancy in the US, 79 years. Somalia, 49. One year olds fully immunized against measles in the United States, 93%. In Somalia, 40%. Combined school enrollment in the United States, 99.6%. Somalia, 7.5%. You get the picture, right? The United States is a much, much better place to live than Somalia. Here's how you should not interpret the data that I just presented, but in fact, the way that most people do interpret the data. Somalia would be better off without government. The question that you have to ask yourself, which is, you might think on the surface, a reasonable thing to conclude having looked at the data, if I tell you, Column two is anarchy, column one is government. Which one do you want to live in? Everyone will say column one. 
thing you have to ask yourself, or the reason why you can't automatically conclu conclude that Somalia would be better off under government, is because you have to first address the problem of what kind of government you're talking about. Would Somalia be better off under US style, what I call first best quality government? Of course it would. Would Somalia, however, be better off under what I'll call nth best quality government? Maybe not. What I want to do, as you're getting a sense here, is encourage the arrangement of qualities of governance, both in terms of state quality and self-governance or anarchic qualities. You can think about going from first best, as I mentioned a moment, moment ago, to nth best in both cases. A hypothetical OECD country, a wealthy country in the world, might have, as this rectangle that I've drawn, the following institutional opportunity set. It could choose anything that's within the rectangles. It could choose second best government, or nth best anarchy, or nth best government, or third best anarchy. You'll notice that this is a rectangle. It doesn't have slanted sides to it. The reason for that is that the types of things that tend to dictate the type of governmental quality that you'll have, if you're thinking about it from a national perspective, also tend to be the same sorts of things that will enable a similar quality level of non-governmental forms of uh, governance. In other words, the United States, if it had anarchy, would probably have a reasonably high quality level of anarchy, or system of self-governance. That doesn't mean it'd be better than its government. That's not my point. I'm just simply making the point that rich countries have at their disposal the full range, more or less, of the qualities of government and pretty much the full range of the qualities of self-governance, which again may or may not be a lot worse. That's, that's not the question I'm asking. But the point is that you will tend to be restricted, therefore, in ways that create a rectangle as opposed to a diagonal line. So that's what a rich country's institutional opportunity set looks like, a country like the United States. Here's what a hypothetical LDC's institutional opportunity set looks like. Does it have available to it because of its history? Because of, although this is endogenous, its income, its education level, social capital in the country, if you want to think about it that way, its geography, its technology, all of those things limit the quality of institutions it can have, both whether it results to self-governance or government. What I call the fallacy of unconstrained choice which is committed by the conventional wisdom with respect to hardest case anarchy, is pretending as though a country that in fact confronts the black box as its institutional opportunity set, pretending as though it in fact, it actually encounters the red box, which it does not. If you pretend that a society is unconstrained in what it can choose, when in fact it's restricted to a very small set, you're going to get, as I'm gonna show you in a moment, some bad answers. The fallacy of unconstrained choice leads directly to the corresponding fallacy, which is the fallacy of irrelevant comparisons. And anything that you see with a red arrow here is an irrelevant institutional comparison. If a country is restricted to this as its institutional opportunity set, then it doesn't matter how first best government, for example, compares to nth best anarchy, the bold red uh, arrow. That comparison, the reason it's bolded, is because that's what I showed you on the, the first slide with the table on it. The United States under government versus Somalia under anarchy. That's comparing second best or first best high quality government to low quality anarchy. That doesn't matter for Somalia, however, if in fact this is their institutional opportunity set. Just like it doesn't matter how these things compare or those things compare. Anything that's not in the box is irrelevant. Does that make sense to everyone? It's an irrelevant comparison. It's not a choice that people have. If you only are wealthy enough to choose between Toyotas and Hondas, the fact that Ferraris dominate both is irrelevant for your choice. The issue with the conventional wisdom <laughs> is this. When you commit the two fallacies, which is to say you throw economics out the window, Here's what your comparative political economy looks like. It's like a constrained optimization problem without a constraint in it. You can say anything you want. 
That's the kind of thing, the unicorn is equivalent to the slide with the table with the United States, or as, is as informative as the slide with the table that compares the United States under government welfare and Somalia under anarchy welfare. When in fact you restrict a country, or I'm sorry, restrict your comparative analysis to relevant institutions, things that are inside the constrained set, you get something that looks like this. Here's Somalia before and after its government collapsed. Five year periods, 85 to 90, and then 2000 to 2005 under the stateless period. Here's the brief summary. On 14 of the 18 available indicators that permit comparison, these are not cherry picked, this is all for which data are available. Under 14 of the 18 indicators, Somalia performs better under anarchy than it does under government. That's not because things are grand in Somalia. I showed you before, especially when we compared it to the United States, things are terrible in Somalia. But things are better in Somalia under anarchy than they were under government. Not because we have a high quality stateless environment in Somalia, but because when we have nth best government and nth, nth best anarchy, nth best anarchy dominates, at least in this case. Even though it may remain true that first best government dominates first best anarchy, and that we know it's true, that first best government dominates nth best anarchy. Somalia, I want to submit to you then, is a real world example of, go of no government outperforming government, which is a simple result of, again, paying attention to the fact that constraints exist. The way you interpret these data is not by saying Somalia is doing well under anarchy, which people constantly accuse me of. Turn, on, turn up your hearing aid. I'm not claiming that. Nor is the correct interpretation that Somalia is better off under anarchy than it would be under any government. People also accuse me of this. That is not my contention. My contention is instead that Somalia is better off under anarchy than it was under its previous government. And that furthermore, if you think that Somalia's recent experience with government is a likely proxy, as I do, for reasons that are given in the book, which I think are quite commonsensical, is a, pro a reasonable proxy for the type of government Somalia is likely to get if one were reintroduced, which is what the international community wants. If you think it's a reasonable proxy for that, then we can also conclude that Somalia is better off under anarchy than it would be under its likely future government. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we'll hear first from John. Those are some bonus slides. Okay, well, <clears throat> let me begin by thanking Pete for inviting me over here. It's a real pleasure to be over here. I always like the opportunity to visit at GMU, and I'm grateful to Mercatus and all of you for inviting me over. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book, but on reflection, I began to think that I'm perhaps the, the worst choice for a commentator on the book that they could have selected. And the reason for that is, first of all, I'm not an economist, so that means I'm not well equipped to critique it on the basis of any of the empirical research techniques. I, mean, I read the book, it made sense to me. If there is a flaw in its support, I don't have the capability to find it. So it, I... Uh, Which is why you were so... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you would need someone with a higher level of expertise to criticize the research techniques. So I can't do that. And the other thing is that in the on the first page of the book, the author makes it very clear what his purpose is in the book. And his announced purpose is to persuade the reader that anarchy works better than you think. That's what the book's all about. And the problem is that in my case, that's probably impossible. <laughs> I'm already persuaded so that I'm not going to be a good 
one to see the force of the argument. In other words, uh, his argument seems very natural to me. He's making a comparison that corresponds to my, the way I think already. He can't actually change my mind to come to his side of the issue. So this is why I'm not the best commentator. However, since I'm here, I would like to think I could say something insightful. I'm doubtful about that. Let me see if I can uh, do anything. First, let me talk a, a little bit about some of the virtues in the book. I'm going to recommend the book to you. I think it's worth reading. First of all, it's well written. I, I review a lot of academic books. Finally, one that you can read through without any trouble. So it's well written. It's clear. You'll get the point very quickly. It's an enjoyable book to read. But it does some things that are, are really, really important. Uh, one is that this book makes it, it makes it clear what the question you should be asking is, and that's that you should be making the proper comparison. So, um, for I'll, I'll go to the first. He's making the proper comparison. What you want to do is you want to compare the way things work under one hypothesis with the way they actually work under the other hypothesis. You'll be sure that you're not committing what's called a nirvana fallacy if you read through this book, which is comparing the way things work under one hypothesis with the ideal functioning of an alternative. We, all of us, look around the world and we see ways in which there are problems. There are, there, we see ways in which the world could be improved. There's ways in which markets fail. We can identify that. Theoretically, we might also be able to see how it could be better. But what really matters is what, how the way the world is actually working compares to the way proposed solutions would actually work. So this gets the comparison right. And um, Pete is very careful to give you a full explanation of the uh, possibility. So with regard to anarchy, when you read through this, you will have described to you the way self-governance in the various cases that he addresses works. He'll give you the positive side, and then he'll also include the negative side, the way in which it doesn't work ideally. So you get a full description of the self-governance um, side of the coin. And then, of course, when you look at government, you have to do the same thing. You'll get the positive side of government, but you'll also get the negative side described. One thing that's really useful here is that he points out Many governments, perhaps the majority of governments, are not like the Western liberal democracies. They are predatory, and if you're going to compare those situations to self-government, to self-governance, then you have to take into account the way those governments behave. So at one level, what we have here is the correct comparison is being made. And it's being made in a very forthright way so that you get the pluses and minuses on both sides of the equation. Another thing about this book, I mean, after he identifies the purpose, which is to show that anarchy works better than you think, in the beginning of his book, he's very insistent that, I'll quote it, this book's analyses are positive, not normative. They describe how the world is or was, not how it should be. And in fact, the book does adhere to that. Right, that's, that should be simple, but that's a good thing. Because very, very often when you have descriptions of supposedly purely empirical descriptions of the way the world works, often there's some normative assumptions smuggled in. I don't find any of that in this book. So uh, not, I'm in the wrong place to say anything negative about economists, but um, often what you'll find is descriptions of what's going to be more or less efficient, a more or less efficient way of doing something, coupled with an unstated assumption that you should do whatever is the most efficient, that that somehow is the correct value to pursue. Right, that's a question. I mean, economics can tell you what's more or less efficient. That's a very important consideration to take into account, but it's not the only thing. Sometimes the right thing to do is something that's going to be less efficient, that's going to destroy wealth rather than increase wealth in some kind of material sense. So there's the normative question is left over, and this book honestly doesn't address this. He's talking about He's making a comparison between the efficiency of self-government, of self-governance, and the efficiency of government, and the, the comparison is appropriate. So in all of the, these ways, I find the book to be interesting and worthwhile, and I can recommend it to you. All right, is there anything I can add to this? 
Um, maybe not. What, what can someone whose main field of endeavor is normative have to say about a book whose des description says this is all positive work? Well, maybe the only thing I can do is provide a little bit of context. I, I'm very glad that the book was written. Why? Because I'll be able to use it. What we have here is an empirical description of the way things work in the real world. And that's important to any normative argument you want to make. If you want to engage in normative argumentation, there's always two premises in any normative argument. One is the premise that describes what the right thing to do is, what correct action is. One's, one is a prescription, it's a statement of value. And that's important, and if that's all you have, you get nowhere. Because knowing where you want to go or knowing what the right goal is means nothing unless you have some idea how to get there. And to get there, you have to know how the world works. So you need the empirical premise as well. So there's a lot of useful empirical information in here. I, I'll be able to use it when I'm making arguments of a normative, of a normative type. To perhaps put it in context or show what the use is, let me take the most widely subscribe to argument for government, at least in our culture. I'll, you know, this, is a, this is sort of the viewpoint of liberalism. Let's say we're talking about a liberal democracy. Let's say we're talking about liberalism. Liberalism is a position in which the starting baseline assumption is that coercion is an evil that needs justification. If you're going to force people to do things rather than persuade them to do things, doesn't mean you can't use coercion. It means coercion needs justification. The baseline is you should not act coercively if you're going to engage in coercion, then there has to be some good reason to do so. That's your basic starting point if you're liberal, and the argument for government that we encounter most frequently is the Lockean argument, which is a liberal argument. Basically, the Lockean argument has two parts. It says that, <coughs> starting from a liberal viewpoint, it says that human beings need the kind of mechanisms that will allow us to live together in peace. What we need is an impartial way of making the law, impartial adjudicators so we know how to apply the rules, and then we need parties empowered to execute the rules. So you need legislative, judicial, and executive functions. That's what's required for us to live and cooperate and have a peaceful and prosperous society. Second premise is that the only way to attain that is through setting up a government. And government, right, Locke and liberals don't deny that government uses coercion. It's coercive. We, when you pass a law, it's not optional. It forces people to comply with the law. So it's using coercion. It's using force. But it's justified. And what justifies it is that it's necessary to provide these basic services that get society going, that allow us to have a cooperative society. The arguments in this book cast doubt on that second premise, on the empirical premise. Let's say that government is justified, government coercion is justified, if it is necessary to allow us to live together in peace and cooperate and prosper. Without challenging that, the question should be, is that true? If what you get is, an argument that shows where self-governance provides those services equally or more effectively in comparison to the government that's available, then the second premise is subject to doubt. And you have a normative argument to say, we would be not just more wealthy or better off in some material sense with self-governance, but that the right thing to do is to move to an anarchic state. Right? Government's justified where it's truly necessary. To the extent that you're showing it's not necessary, you're showing that it's not justified as well. So this is an empirical premise that you can use for a normative argument, at least in that context. But let me say one more thing before I conclude, and I actually think that this is, the presentation was very interesting, and I'd like to see the discussion. There's lots of questions and maybe other examples that can come, out, come up in our discussion that would be useful, so I don't want to take up a lot of time. But let me suggest one limitation in the book as it's written now. The book's interesting. I recommend it to you. 
But what the book is doing is it's making the comparison at the lower end of the wealth spectrum. It's like the least developed countries. So Somalia, the box was up there with the nth best. Somalia is not in good shape. And you're comparing the choices between self-governance and government at that level. And there's all kinds of interesting examples in the book. But they're often examples that apply to rather dire circumstances. Um, I, think any, I think anyone can read this. I think my colleagues who are more on the left wing and would like to see government empowered can read this book and understand it and agree with it and enjoy it as well because it doesn't impact their thinking. Why? Because they're dealing with the situation in the United States or in Western Europe or in the more developed countries or in what they call the liberal democracies. And most of the examples are in situations, he's looking at can, I, can anarchy survive or is it, can it be more effective in the hard cases where things are really bad. And for a lot of my colleagues, that might be interesting, but who cares because we're not living there. We're living here. How should things be here? So to some extent, the book doesn't touch that, but what would be interesting would be to take the same approach and start moving up the scale. Uh, we should be asking, right, here we have the government process in the United States or in the more developed countries, the ones we call liberal democracies. Here's the way it works. How does that compare to self-governance under these circumstances? What's not treated in the book, maybe it's a future work, something I'd like to see people work on is, what's that first best type of self-governance that would be the proper comparison for the governments we have right now? So a future project could be to do the same for Western societies. And you know, I'm saying this at the same time we're all reading about the events that are taking place in Ferguson, Missouri, right? So that's government provision of police services. Right? So that's the way it is in, if we're going to call the United States the, or the a place where we have the first best government, wouldn't it be interesting to compare what it would be like if we had self-governance self there providing police services? And that might open our eyes to certain things. The same thing that we're talking about the way the government supplies adjudicative services. Well, if you look at that clear-eyed, we have a very, very expensive, bloated, inefficient court system that's bogged down in a lot of things so that it's hard to go to court and settle your disputes. Wouldn't it be worthwhile comparing that to what a self-governing dispute settlement mechanism would look like under our circumstances? I think the same kind of argument that appears in this book could be done at the higher level in the more developed governments and could give equally interesting results. So let me stop there and turn it over to Barack. Yeah. Uh, great. <clears throat> um, like John, uh, I will thank the Mercatus Center uh, for being here. Uh, thank Pete for a really terrific book. Uh, it's an honor. It was a pleasure to read and an honor to talk about it. Um, and like John, uh, I'm, I'm eager to open up discussion, so I'll try to be as brief, of, uh, as, brief as I can. Um, what I'd like to do is identify what I think is the book's biggest contribution, actually, because the book is, is to a large degree a collection of essays, I'm really talking about the enormous contribution that Pete has made in the last number of years, and it really, it's hard to overstate that. Um, so I'd like to couch it in the intellectual tradition, the academic, in the academic tradition that it that falls in, um, uh, and then point to some directions uh, moving forward, what sort of questions, academic questions and scholarly questions it opens up. So my, the academic tradition begins with Hobbes. Uh, Hobbes says you need a government in order to ensure cooperation. That's a enormous simplification of what he says. Um, what is very, very impressive about the book is that on page one, uh, Pete goes after Hobbes. This is, this is an ambitious project. He goes after Hobbes, and he does so impressively. Um, if the story begins with Hobbes, I'll say that we, this, is, this, is my, this is my lineage. Hobbes, Hayek, Buchanan, Ellickson, Williamson, Greif, Dixit, Leeson. Not bad, huh? <laughs> 
Hobbes says you need a government. Hayek says, well, you know, look, uh, there are lots of problems with government. What you really want to do in order to sustain uh, both individual liberty, economic performance, and to a large degree just benefits uh, utility in the society, you want to harness spontaneous order. You want to give individuals as much freedom as they can to arrange their own affairs. So this balance between Hobbes and Hayek really is the, the intellectual battlegrounds where not just Pete, but other people have really tried to figure out. We know that the government is there for a number of things. Hobbes wasn't entirely wrong. There's no question about that. But how can you harness the power of individual freedom that Hayek talks about and still make, him, make Hayek compatible with Hobbes? Buchanan comes after Hayek and says, look, not only does the government do lots of good things, uh, but it does a lot of bad things also. So within this framework of how can we use Hayek and, and Buchanan to inform Hobbes? How can we come up with some kind of alternative arrangement to achieve these Hobbesian uh, accomplishments without the Hobbesian mechanism? That is the central challenge that Pete's work tries to address. Um, I mentioned the institutional economists. I kind of have to because this is my PhD advisor, <laughs> got to pay homage to him. Um, Oliver Williamson, along with him, Eleanor Olmstrom, Doug North, other the institutional economists said, look, you don't need Hobbes, but you need something. So once you have this balance between Hobbes and Hayek, Pete comes in with this, within the world of institutional economists, says, I want to see what we can figure out. And he calls it anarchy. Um, it certainly can be described as anarchy, but to a large degree, it doesn't give himself enough credit. What's remarkable about this piece, about the, the, these series of pieces, is not that he describes all phases of anarchy, but that it's a bottom-up approach. He looks really at the microanalytic elements of how individuals uh, are in appropriately incentivized to cooperate and the mechanisms, the institutions that they create. It is very much a bottom-up, a very nuanced and very empirically based project which is very much in line with the institutional economists, much more so, I think, than the political philosophers. Um, so within this framework, you have to come up with a Hobbesian solution without necessarily the Hobbesian mechanism uh, is where the institutional economists and Pete start their project. Bob Ellickson wrote a very famous book in 1990 called Order Without Law, said, hey, you know what, these people, these ranchers in Shasta County, Northern California, actually get along fine without the government. It's not a terribly surprising insight. Um, and maybe it was just the timing of the finding, but all of a sudden, for what, and look, it, it's a brilliant book, but for whatever reason, that very intuitive, very obvious discovery that actually neighbors can get along without the police making them get along, opened up a very broad body of scholarship where we took, where scholars looked at different communities across time, across place, and said, hey, there are similar sorts of arrangements that do solve this Hobbesian problem without the Hobbesian solution. Um, uh, and Avinash Dixit formalized this, but this really has been a growth industry since 1990. Um, what I think Pete has really done uh, has said, look, uh, I am finding a certain, a different number of categories of institutions that solve this problem across time, across place, across culture, across technology. Yes, it's interesting that some ranchers in Shasta County have figured this out. What's that tell you about the rest of the world and the rest, and the rest of human history? Well, Pete is kind of telling you that, in fact, it does tell you something about the rest of human history. There has been many, many moments across history, across time, across geography, where, through very different sorts of institutional arrangements, we've solved the Hobbesian problem without government. Um, now, again, this is only surprising because of the way we thought about things not long ago. It was surprising when Ellickson said, you don't need law, you don't need government. Um, only because we thought you, we needed law and government. Now, I teach at a law school. At law schools, it, it, you want to get inside the heads of the law students. Um, we teach about appellate courts. This is what happens when the New York Court of Appeals issues a ruling. And therefore, this is what happens. We don't think about incentives. We don't think about cooperation. We just think about what the court says, what the judge says. Um, 
we take for granted the presence of the marshal. The marshal is the state employee that once the judge says something, the marshal makes it happen. Hey, you have to give over the car. You don't own it anymore. The judge says you have to give the car over. It's my job, the marshal, to make sure that happens. I am the coercion. We don't think about the marshal in law school. We presume that the law is there. We presume the marshal is there. We presume that people follow the law. And what Nick is, what Peter's tell, Pete is telling us is that we haven't always had the marshal. And when we have the marshal, we're actually getting rid of something else. Having the marshal is a trade-off with alternative arrangements. And what he's also telling us is, even though we haven't always had the marshal, we've always had courts, and we've always had law. That is, we've always had rules. In fact, we are a, we are a history. We have 2,000 years of human history, at least 4,000, with laws and with courts. But the marshal, the state-sponsored marshal, is a fairly new phenomenon. So Pete says, look, what we've been thinking about the last hundred years, what I teach my law students, is but the smallest fraction of human history. And what we really should think about is the donut and not the whole. We're only, when we think about courts and marshals, we're only thinking about the whole. When we think about, Pete is telling us that we have to think about the donut. We have to think about cooperation and coercion within a much broader context across history, across geography. So I think that, number one, um, uh, Pete's contributions over the last couple of years has showed us the donut that we should be looking at. Um, and it is enormously illuminating if you look at this from the perspective of law schools. We don't think about this. They assume that all this happens perfectly, and they don't realize exactly what kind of institutional constructs we presuppose and we rely upon, and what sort of alternatives are out there. So I think it's an enormous contribution. Um, it's surprising that this is surprising. That is, it's surprising that uh, Bob Ellickson, when he opened up this literature about 20 years ago, got the attention that it did. It's surprising that it burst so many presuppositions, but once it did, it really begged the kind of scholarship that Pete has been doing. It said, hey, this is actually very much the norm, and the introduction of the Marshall is a fairly recent phenomena for this age-old problem. So that's really where I think Pete's contribution is. I think it's enormous. It cannot be, it's very hard to overstate that. Um, so what's next? I have three, idea of what, uh, three ideas of what's next. Idea number one is very much what John said. It is on page 155, footnote two. It says, all right, well, if what we're looking at uh, are uh, institutional arrangements to support cooperation where there really is no state, no well-working, sophisticated state, is there a role here for the modern state? Is there anarchy within the modern state? I think that's an enormously valuable uh, question. One reason is because that's where my scholarship is. Um, and what we really want to think about is how can we understand the problem of the challenge of Somalia or the challenge of uh, the African tribe villages or the, uh, the challenge uh, of the borders uh, between the UK and Scotland. These are all, by the way, historical examples that are very richly lined out in the book. Um, how can we understand those lessons and apply those lessons to the modern economy? I think that there still is a role for what, oh, it's a shameless plug, what I call stateless commerce. There very much still is a role for self-governance for private ordering within a sophisticated modern economy. And that is one thing that I think uh, is the, it, one area uh, that begs additional discussion, begs additional um, scrutiny, and is really opened up uh, by what Pete has looked at. The second thing I think is looked at Pete's work does is tell us how important an interdisciplinary approach is. Some people call economists um, uh, imperialists, uh, and to some degree, what Pete does is he takes the rule, the, takes the laws of economics, the methodologies of economics, and applies it in areas that have not been where economists have not really have kind of feared to tread. To some degree, that might be imperialism. What it really is, though, is he's trying to answer very, very complex, complicated questions about human behavior and incentives. Um, and I think he's not just using economics. I say I think this is a very rich, very interdisciplinary book. And that begs other questions. Uh, we are not just looking at 
uh, the benefits of reciprocal exchange anymore. We're really looking at how individuals uh, are socialized, what their, in, what their incentives are as they've been socialized, what social structures they're a part of, um, what community structures, what cultural structures shape their incentives, constrain their behaviors. This is a very, very rich and very, very important insight into human conduct that is uh, it's deeply simplified if we only think about it in terms of um, commercial exchange. If we only think about it in terms of trying to um, maximize the benefits of trade. The next step is really try to use these tools and these insights and these questions that Pete brings up and try to understand the larger and more embedded structures of our society. Um, that, those are really important questions. They're important economic questions to be sure, but they're also important sociological questions, important questions for the social sciences. And I think economists, especially those in this group, are especially suited to answer those very important questions. Um, it talks, uh, it asks, has us focus, uh, focusing on bottom-up arrangements, uh, inquiries into psychology, the development of norms. This actually might be the real uh, nexus between what Pete does and what Vernon Smith does in terms of thinking exactly how individuals engage uh, in an economic marketplace. Um, and the third thing, I think, uh, third areas of questions that this opens up is the following. Uh, Pete's book tells us why and how anarchy can work. And I think it also can tell us how government can work, or how it cannot work, or how it works sometimes when it does. You have to think about the question, when the Supreme Court, nine people, persistently five people, issue a ruling, it's kind of remarkable how quickly and widespread that ruling is adopted. That's not because of the marshal. I mean, the marshal has a role in that, but the marshal is not coercing 250 million people to adhere to the Supreme Court. There is something about the socialization of, our, uh, of individuals in our democracy, about the socialization of public officers, about the instruments in which we constrain uh, behavior of both public and private officers that can be answered with these methodologies. We can understand a lot more about government and not just about anarchy with Pete's insights and with Pete's work. Um, nothing works well, as he said, uh, and uh, nothing works well all the time. Um, but we do have a remarkably complicated system of order. It involves private ordering and public ordering. Uh, and it is not just because of economic payoffs. It is because of the embedded structures that we have in our society that Pete, uh, Pete's methodologies can help us understand. Uh, I deeply encourage all of us to think about the, in, the institutions that constrain our behavior, the things that create incentives that induce human behavior in certain ways, and think about them through a bottom-up, tractable, microanalytic approach that Pete uses in his book. Um, this is an enormously pleasurable book to read. It's a book that is enormously rich with lots of lessons, uh, and like good scholarship, it asks just as many questions as it answers. So uh, I'm thrilled to be able to comment on his contribution, and I am thrilled to be able to continue the conversation with Pete as he and hopefully others take on these other questions. Thank you.